welcome, all of you, and good afternoon. So having done most of my academic studies on languages, whenever I embark on a new subject or become interested in a new topic, the first thing I do is to look into the meaning or the core word that is related to that subject. And the subject today is impossibilities. What does impossible mean? And before delving into what it personally means to me, what does it literally mean? Um, the word impossible comes from the Latin word posse, meaning to be able to do something. And it's also related to the word potent, meaning powerful, incidentally also meaning able to reach an orgasm, but sadly this is not what we're going to talk about today. Um, moving on from the literal meaning of the word, and because of the word's relation to power, when we say that something is impossible, we imply that one lacks the power to achieve it or realize it. Yet words only have meaning can only be, and can only be valuable as far as the value that we choose to confer onto them. The same goes for the word impossible. Um, the ultimate point is not about the, about the literal realizability of an action. We only perceive acts, situations or events as either unrealizable and therefore impossible. Yet it only takes one to show the world that they're not. Um, history, for example, is filled with amazing examples of people who have done the impossible. Can you imagine the fear that the tank man felt when he stood up in front of the People's Liber Liberation Army tanks at Tiananmen Square in 1989? This ordinary figure, shopping bags in his hands, became a symbol of peaceful resistance all over the world. It is the example that you can achieve what so many people think is impossible. To this day, we have no idea what happened to him. He might have been let off by the soldiers in an act of mercy, or he might have been executed then and there. But somehow this is not even important, because this is the image of a man who was fed up with the mindless persecution and violence that was going on, and decided to stand up. And stand up, literally, in front of tanks, but also against the morally bankrupt idea. He showed what can be done just by a single, seemingly unimportant individual. He did the impossible. One could also cite the example of Harriet Tubman, who lived at a time when people could own other people in the United States. Harriet Tubman was a slave, but not only that, she was a, she was a female slave, at a time when even white American women did not enjoy the same rights as their male counterparts, and to say the least, were second-class citizens. Harriet Tubman amazingly managed to escape from her enslavers, which was a massive achievement on its own, but she did not just stop there. She went back into the slave states 13 times overall and rescued 70 slave families. Later on in her life, she also became an active supporter of women's suffrage movement. The single woman did so much for the civil rights movement that was to come years later. She said, I can't die but once, and thought that she had to do something, that she had to resist. I would also like to talk about Witold Pilecki, in honor of us doing this TEDx talk um, here in Warsaw, Poland. He was prisoner 4859 in the Auschwitz concentration camp, but he hadn't gone there by force. He volunteered to go there. Uh, he was one of the founders of the secret Polish army when Nazi Germany invaded Poland in November 1939. And when the secret army first became aware of the Auschwitz concentration camp, he decided that if he could get himself arrested, then it'd probably be sent to Auschwitz. And once there, he could gather intelligence for the Allies, as well as organize an inmate resistance, which is exactly what he did. Despite stomach problems, typhus, extremely heavy labor, and cruelty at the hands of the Nazi guards, he managed to organize an inmate resistance and compiled the first comprehensive report on the Holocaust uh, for the Allies. Furthermore, after he escaped from Auschwitz, he participated in the 1944 Warsaw Rising. After that, after the communist takeover of the country of Poland, um, he remains loyal to the Polish government in exile and um, uh, gathered intelligence for them in Poland against the oppressive communist rule. Unfortunately, he was arrested and after torture and a show trial, he was executed in 1948. After the announcement of his death sentence, he said, I've been trying to live my life so that in the hour of my death, I would rather feel joy than fear. 
Now, he was simply one of the most important heroes of the Second World War. Volunteering to go to the Auschwitz concentration camp was indeed so honorable, so respectable, so heroic, that it would have been enough for a, for a lifetime. He would still be remembered um, throughout the end of the human history just for doing that. But he did so much more. And I think this says so much about our perception of what possible is and what impossible is. These amazing people I have cited and their stories show us what can be done by perseverance. And they make us think about how we should lead our own lives. And the takeaway from all this is that impossible is in fact only a perception. If you're frustrated, disappointed, abandoned, if you're left to your own devices, if you're persecuted for your beliefs or ideals, if your life is under threat by thugs who have lost their moral compass, if uh, bigots or whatever nature are preventing you from living the life that you like to live, then you feel things are impossible. Yet I'll say it again, it only takes one to show the world that impossible can be made possible. Now, turning away from history and at the risk of sounding pompous or even implying that I could be considered in the same category as these people, I'd like to talk about myself. I was born in 1988, um, started to talk at um, age one and never shut up after that. As you can see, even in this photo, I'm talking. And I also start, sort of tried to squeeze the photo to make myself look thinner. <laughs> but sadly, that doesn't seem to work. Um, I like to talk about myself because people my friends, and especially my friends here at the College of Europe in Netherlands, seem to think that I am also impossible. Um, let me tell you why. First of all, I consider myself to be a democratic socialist, although I agree that the term needs a bit of clarifying. Now, there are a lot of democratic socialists in the world, or people who in some way or another vibrate to socialism, so that's no biggie. I'm also gay. I don't want to put two naked guys walking on a beach with their dog or something like that, or two naked guys kissing. So this is a generic gay love image that I found from Google. Um, now, being gay puts me in anywhere from 5 to 10% of the world population. So that is certainly a minority. I'm also an atheist, uh, which means that I share this attribute with anywhere from 3 to 13% of our fellow um, primates. So that is definitely a minority as well. Now, the combination of these three epithets or personal traits or qualities certainly does not make me an oddity or impossibility in itself. But the reason why people seem to think I am an impossible combination of things is because I also come from Turkey. And having all these traits and being all these things, I'm inherently happy about it. At the moment, Turkey is run by a very conservative government a country in which the majority of the population is traditionally homophobic, a country that has a very strong, overwhelmingly Muslim um, population. That's pe why people always ask me the questions, for example, isn't it difficult to be gay in Turkey? Can you talk freely about atheism in Turkey? Well, Turkey is certainly not the dream country for a gay, democratic, socialist atheist. It's not, it's not the paradise, obviously. Um, but let me tell you this, I am happy, um, I choose to be so. I'm not only happy because I'm now away from my country, because I'm never really away from it anyway in my mind. I constantly follow the news, I constantly talk to my friends about what is going on in the country. I am happy because I love my country and I believe that um, there are good people in my country who have big hearts and big minds. Whatever the current conditions may be, I know that there are people in my country who would never exercise bigotry against any kind of minority and would stand up with them to defend their rights, whatever those rights may be. Whatever those rights may be. I know there are people in my country who supported the right to university education of veiled women, even some, some of them atheists like me. They supported the right to university education of veiled women to the point that they were shunned by, by their own peers. I know that there are people in my country who stood up with me against the imminent threat of being beaten up by police officers during the Gezi protests because they believed in raising their voice rather than keeping silent. I know there are people in my country who will face prison to say what they think because they believe in the sacrifice of burning themselves so that there might be light to eliminate others. Yet many of my friends in Turkey, when I talk to them, they say, it is getting worse. 
that there's so much pressure that they can't deal with it. They're using the same word that we're discussing here today, as a matter of fact. They're saying it is becoming impossible to live there. I understand and I sympathize, but to me, they are still fundamentally wrong. Things are going badly in Turkey, and I'm the first to admit it. I also think that one's criticism of one's country, government, history or culture doesn't mean that one is against it, doesn't mean that one doesn't like it. It just means simply that one wants to make, make it better. The first step in, in solving any problem is to recognize that there is a problem. Um, but the solution, I think, is not to escape. The solution is not to leave behind. The solution is to resist. If history has taught us one thing, that is the fact that anything can be changed by resistance. Anything can be changed by resisting. Change is not impossible. It may be tough, you may be abandoned, you may be ostracized, you may be put in prison, you may be beaten up. But it is possible, it is realizable. Human dignity, that grand word, requires one to be strong and never to yield, never to give up, never to give in. One should have the right, and one has the responsibility, I think, to resist to any kind of bigotry, either performed by a government or others, either performed against you, your friends, or others. And that last point, I think, is very important. It is important to defend other people's rights as they are yours, like they are yours. A Muslim woman wearing a headscarf, for example, and I don't have much in common. We wouldn't even see eye to eye on a political level, or on probably any level. But what does it make me if I do not stand up for her rights as well? How can I look myself in the mirror, and how can I have dignity and integrity if I don't stand up for her and support her rights too? This is what human dignity and integrity requires, to be able to look yourself in the mirror without shame, without fear, and say that you're doing the right thing to know in your heart that you're not compromising your ideals. Nobody should have the right to tell you how to lead your life, as long as you're not having any effect on them. Why should anyone have the audacity to tell me that? Why should anyone care if I'm gay, for example? Why should anyone concerns themse concern themselves if I don't believe in their God? Why would they pay attention if they and I don't agree on the best way to govern a country? This is why I still believe for any moral argument, our basis should be the golden rule. And it's a very simple rule. One should be treated as, uh, one should treat others as one, one, one would like to be treated. Or in its negative form, one should not treat others as one would not like to be treated. To conclude, impossible really doesn't mean anything to be. Impossible is not how a thing is. Impossible is how you choose to think about a thing. Once you realize that the boundaries that we set for ourselves are very much prone to our own willpower and our ability to persevere in the face of difficulty, you feel the power in yourself to make um, the impossible into possible. Isn't it better then to fight rather than concede defeat? Isn't it better to resist than to submit? Isn't it better, even if you're a minority of one, to be on the right side of history? Isn't it better to live your life in dignity, integrity, honor, rather than fear and shame? If you are confronted with impossibilities, the solution is not to escape, the solution is not to leave behind, the solution is never to bow down. The solution is to raise your head and do the right thing. And you'll understand that then that impossible is only a perception. By submitting yourself to it, you're making it a reality. But if you resist it, then it will waft away in the air. Aren't the examples that I've cited today, that of Witold Pilecki, Harriet Tubman, the tank man, enough proof of what can be achieved by perseverance? Isn't it better to try to emulate their examples and try to defend your rights and other people's rights? Do stand up. Do not let anyone tell you how to live your life. Do not let anyone tell others how to lead their lives. That is not impossible. Thank you for listening.